Hello everyone, and welcome back to the Fluctus Channel. The United States, as well as most other developed nations, is known to spend billions of dollars a year on research and development. Across the country, there are hundreds of both government and military facilities dedicated to advancing technology, or better understanding the world around us. In recent years, much of this research and development has incorporated robotics, artificial intelligence, or other types of advanced digital machinery. A good example of this is the Welding Automation Lab. which could develop robots to repair ship damage while the boat is at sea. Other facilities are able to mimic extreme temperatures. Allowing the military to see how planes, tanks and personnel react to freezing or sweltering conditions. Another example is the firefighting training facilities, where different types of blazes are simulated, giving military personnel a chance to practice with their equipment and try new tactics. There's also an unmanned aerial systems laboratory which often test drones and other aircraft at the Navy's Surface Warfare Center. Known as indoor oceans, there are several of these massive water-filled facilities spread around the United States. The indoor ocean title refers specifically to the Maneuvering and Seakeeping Basin, or MASC, which is located at the Carter Rock Division of Naval Surface Warfare in Maryland. This giant tank is 240 feet wide and 360 feet long. The depth, meanwhile, ranges between 20 and 50 feet. This gives the pool the capacity to hold more than 12 million gallons of water. But the mask's size is not the only thing that makes it unique. For instance, the basin is lined with more than 200 finger-like paddles, which are capable of acting as wave generators and wave absorbers. Depending on the setting, the mass can create waves as long as 105 feet and as high as 3 feet. It can also simulate multi-direction wave conditions of short crested seas for high accurate hydrodynamic modeling. Modeling is the operative word here. As large as the mask is, it's meant to be used with scale versions of new vessels. This gives the researchers and the engineers valuable information about how the ship will perform when completed. The pool has a 376 foot bridge installed on a rail system above it. This is what allows the various ship models to move through the water. It also gives researchers the ability to view the various tests from above. The Naval Surface Warfare Center tests models of submarines surface ships, aerial Navy vehicles, and more. This is the 8x10 subsonic wind tunnel. We've been using this facility to help characterize the airflow around the top side of a Navy ship. And that's really important because we fly a lot of manned and unmanned aerial vehicles off of Navy ships. 
So we really have to characterize the flow to know where to put those launch and recovery uh, stations aboard a ship. But as advanced as the facility is, the site has been up and running for over 100 years. For instance, the David Taylor Model Basin was built in the early 1930s. It houses two separate tow tanks, one that is 50 feet wide and one that is 22 feet wide. Together, they contain more than 30 million gallons of water. and measure 5 eighths of a mile long. Here, surface ships and submarine models up to 30 feet long can be towed through the water by crane machinery mounted on rails above the pools. Meanwhile, they can collect a wide range of hydrodynamic data, especially as related to power and resistance. One of the many structural facilities that we have on Carter Rock is the deep submerges pressure tank. And within this pressure tank, we can put scale models of submarines or submersible hulls in the tank, fill it with water, pressurize it, and simulate those depths before the sub is even built or goes to those depths. However, the David Taylor model basin does not have the ability to make waves. That's why the next step in hydrodynamic testing is typically the mask. Thanks to the research data collected by buoys and satellites, the paddle system can mimic wave patterns from all over the world. This means that researchers can actually see how a model will perform in a variety of different oceans or seas. Once a military vessel is deployed to the ocean, it must still undergo a series of crucial tests and drills. Among the most important of all are the full ship shock trials. During these evaluations, high-powered explosives are detonated within various proximities of the ship. One of the latest shock trials was performed on the newly finished USS Gerald R. Ford the largest and most advanced aircraft carrier in the United States fleet. As the explosives are set off, computers aboard the ship carefully measure how the bombs affect the ship's hull, electronics, and weapon systems. The goal is to identify even the slightest weakness that an enemy could potentially exploit. And while the hull of the Gerald R. Ford is heavily armored, even distant explosions can send shockwaves that can disrupt or damage the ship's ability to function. In the end, it's worth putting the ship at risk in order to identify potential problems. The average Nimitz-class aircraft carrier, which is the predecessor to the Gerald R. Ford class, weighs 100,000 tons and measures just short of 1,100 feet long. Despite their immense bulk, these vessels do not need to rely on armor alone when confronted with a potential threat. Indeed. The ship's two nuclear-powered steam turbine engines are capable of putting out immense power. This makes the massive ships surprisingly fast and maneuverable. This Nimitz-class carrier, the USS Abraham Lincoln, is practicing evasive maneuvers in the Atlantic Ocean. Moving at speeds of up to 35 miles per hour, the ship is able to execute high-speed turns that would be impressive for even a much smaller vessel. 
Thanks to these capabilities, a carrier can hide in the open ocean by covering up to 700 square miles of distance in just half an hour. This makes it even more difficult for enemies to pinpoint the ship's exact location, even with the benefits of powerful sonar. The U.S. military also has a number of facilities specifically dedicated to the testing of offensive weapons. In 2017, the Office of Naval Research conducted experiments using an electromagnetic railgun, which relies on electrical pulses to launch projectiles up to 100 nautical miles. Not only does this revolutionary railgun design eliminate the need for gunpowder or chemical firing mechanisms, but it can launch its projectiles at speeds of over 4,500 miles per hour. During the test, the railgun was secured to a large system of metal decks. For safety purposes, the railgun was pointed out into the middle of the ocean throughout the live fire test. This is hardly the first test of an electromagnetic railgun of this type. Indeed, the U.S. has invested millions into researching the potential of such a gun, as it could revolutionize warfare in a number of ways. Still, there remain several challenges to getting the railgun into service. Mostly, these center around durability and projectile guidance. Many current railgun models fire so quickly and with so much energy that the barrels can only tolerate a few shots before they become damaged. Preparing to fire a full-scale railgun is a process in and of itself. For starters, Electromagnetic railguns require a huge amount of electricity. At the time of this test, only the Zumwalt-class destroyers were able to produce enough power to get the desired performance from such a gun. The projectiles are managed by an auto-loader system, which is located underneath the gun. Meanwhile, the entire test is supervised by a team of engineers and weapons experts in a specially designed control room. Once the gun is fired, these men and women are able to collect vast amounts of data about the projectile, the gun, and the supporting systems. Though these projectiles had no explosives during the test, they reached speeds approaching Mach 7. This would allow them to deliver huge amounts of energy on impact. As ships, planes, and weapons become more advanced, militaries around the world have come to rely more and more on robotics and artificial intelligence. This includes virtually all steps of the process including testing and manufacturing. At the Air Force Research Lab in Texas, engineers are testing a new 22,000-pound A5 multi-purpose robotic system. The test featured the robot performing a number of different tasks, including sanding a mock section of a C-17. The A5 uses real-time sensor data to conduct work within a localized environment. Nearly all modern robotics are the product of military research in one way or another. As the Army, Navy and Air Force have always been on the cutting edge of the industry.
One of the biggest and most advanced research facilities in the United States can be found at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base in Ohio. This is the Air Force Research Laboratory's Materials and Manufacturing Directorate. The facility employs more than 4,000 civilians and 1,000 military personnel who collaborate to develop materials, processes, and advanced manufacturing technologies for aircraft, spacecraft, missiles, and ground-based systems. The various systems found at this sprawling compound range from highly advanced and experimental to simple manufacturing areas. The AFRL-RX works at every single stage of aerospace material development. Here, scientists can test new material theories using high-powered computers. Once a proper solution is found, it will typically be manufactured right on site. In total, there are more than 300 individual laboratories on the base, allowing maximum innovation at all times. In the end, there is simply no overstating how important research and testing are to the U.S. military's mission. These facilities have resulted in some of the most advanced aircraft, weaponry, and defense systems. Recent innovations include a new, lighter version of body armor that employs ceramic rather than heavy steel. Researchers are also testing a bodysuit which can provide mobility assistance to soldiers as they march, reducing the stress on their bodies and allowing them to cover more ground at a time. Other men and women are testing coating technology that can keep sand from building up in aircraft engines and causing them to fail. From new UAVs to anti-drone guns to robotic soldiers, what will eventually become the future of the battlefield often gets its start in a lab. That's the end of this video. I hope you enjoyed it. Make sure to subscribe to this channel so you don't miss any of our new content. See you next time.